high-rise residences are becoming increasingly common in our cities and suburbs. In this module, we will look at minimising noise transfer between apartments in multi-res buildings. Before we consider installation solutions, it's important to understand noise and the requirements for acoustic treatment. We'll be covering noise measurement, national construction code, strata title and council requirements, noise control and testing, acoustic underlays and installation. Sound is measured in decibels, shown as a lowercase db. The decibel scale is used to measure different levels of loudness perceived by our ears. It is also used to specify sound requirements. Decibels are a measure of the degree of sound pressure that causes a noise to be loud or soft. Zero dB would be near silence. Around 15 dB, a whisper. And we normally talk at around 60 dB. To give you an idea of sensitivity, a reduction of, say, three decibels would be perceptible to human ears, while a 10 decibel variation would be a clear change in loudness. Now we need to understand what LNTW is. The international standard ISO 717-2 is used to assess the noise transmission through a floor into a room below. Noise test results provide a single figure to assess noise, which is the LNTW, or the Weighted Standardised Impact Sound Pressure Level. The lower the figure, the better the result. Attenuation refers to the reduction in noise through a flooring system. So the lower the LNTW, the better the attenuation of the flooring system. The National Construction Code, or NCC, requires that the LNTW should be no more than 62 dB for floors separating dwellings. A standard carpet will generally achieve an LNTW of about 40 dB, whereas a 175 mm thick bare concrete slab may provide an LNTW of around 70 dB. Tests with timber flooring that has been adhesive fixed to acoustic underlays and then to a 175 mm concrete slab often achieve results of between 50 dB and 60 dB. It is much more difficult to achieve the code's requirements for attenuation with thinner slabs. The Strata Schemes Management Act permits an apartment block to have its own bylaws to which owners must comply. Building specific bylaws can add additional restrictions that may be much more ambitious than the NCC requirements. An example could be, an owner must ensure that their floor space is covered in such a way as to prevent noise transmission that is likely to disturb the peaceful enjoyment of the owner beneath. You can see how the lack of a specific figure makes this ambiguous subject to a wide range of interpretations. In other apartment blocks, the bylaws may be much simpler, as they may require specific systems that have been trialled and are recommended or accepted. Some councils are now requiring that the separating floors in the apartment blocks must have an LNTW of as low as 40 or 50 dB. This is still quite achievable with timber floors, but requires greater consideration of the ceiling beneath, and more careful design of the acoustic underlay. Higher attenuation also generally means thicker systems and increased cost. The Association of Australian Acoustical Consultants provides guidelines for the acoustic rating in apartments and townhouses. These can be downloaded from the AAAC website. The guidelines provide a star rating to better meet owner expectations and complement the NCC compliance requirements. The floor system is not the only contributor to the star rating, as noise from outside, through walls and lift wells also affects the rating. The system rates two stars as a clearly audible noise transmission through to six stars at which level noise is completely inaudible. The table shows the two factors that determine the star rating, impact noise through floor systems and airborne sound between tenancies. You'll see from the table that an LNTW of 50 for impact sound is given a four-star rating. To control low-frequency noise and vibrations, we need to consider many factors. These include the type of flooring, the slab thickness, the ceiling height, the ceiling system, and whether there's any shock-absorbing acoustic underlay. The flooring and acoustic underlay are only two parts of the system. As shown in the table, high-frequency noises like phones ringing are generally quite easy to control through slab mass. The lower frequency vibrations are harder to manage. They can require a combination of strategies, including the specification of underlay and ceiling systems. 
Although most new apartments run standard acoustic tests, the test costs are often prohibitive for existing apartment owners. An alternative is to consider using the results from a test with similar components, although they can often produce less reliable results. A thorough comparison of the elements like slab thickness is essential to ensuring a successful system. Many companies supplying acoustic underlays have systems that have been tested and can be used as a guide. A test done by the CSIRO of a specifically dimensioned flooring system may produce slightly different LNTW results to an identical system you are proposing. The test report for a floor system will generally contain details including the timber flooring material, for example 14mm engineered flooring, the acoustic material, for example 5mm acoustic mat, the method of fixing, such as polyurethane adhesive, the slab thickness, which could be 150 millimetres, the noise transmission through the bare slab, say 79 dB, the attenuation or reduction in noise transmission, and the LNTW result. The conclusion could be that the system tested meets the NCC requirements, but would not achieve a high star rating with the AAAC. When considering installing a timber floor system in an apartment, questions to consider include, is the system proven? Whose system are you following? The flooring manufacturer or the acoustic underlay manufacturer? Is the slab properly prepared, clean, dry, sound and flat? Is it covered by warranty? Installation over acoustic underlay can fall outside of installation recommendations. Are the adhesives recommended by the product manufacturers? And is the floor being installed to address the correct noise sources? The underlay is an important part of the system so it's important to seek advice from reputable companies. Underlays are made from different materials. Some are specific to adhesive fixed floors and others to floating floors. The images show materials of varying width and composition that can be used as an acoustic underlay, from cork to rubber and polyester. Products are sometimes said to have better acoustic performance because of a higher density. However, higher density does not directly correlate with better acoustic performance. Some underlay manufacturers provide complete flooring system recommendations, matching the type of flooring used with an underlay that is designed for it. The diagram on the left shows a manufacturer's recommendation of an intermediate plywood layer below solid timber flooring. This type of flooring is generally securely fixed to a rigid subfloor. On the right is an engineered floorboard laid as a floating floor. The flooring is still laid on the floating floor underlay over the acoustic underlay. Floating floor underlays allow the flooring to slip freely over the underlay, which it needs to do to float. There are also acoustic underlays made specifically for floating floors. The photo shows two examples of underlays that have been designed to meet the requirements of floating floors as well as providing superior acoustic performance. Remember that acoustic performance results can only be measured by testing, and the results need to meet the NCC requirements. This diagram shows some of the factors you need to consider when installing a floating floor that requires acoustic performance. The diagram shows normal practices and components, however the underlay may be changed to one providing better acoustic performance. The same method is often used with floating, engineered, laminate and bamboo floors. This diagram shows a system where greater acoustic performance is required. It applies to both fixed and floating flooring systems. There are details that are important. First, a more substantial acoustic underlay is used than in the previous diagram. The flooring does not directly contact the skirting or beading at the floor perimeter, and foam backing rods have been used in the expansion voids. Although the diagram shows only adhesive fixed floors, in general terms these methods are used with most floor types, including floated floors, engineered, laminate, bamboo floors, and adhesive fixed floors. Delivering the appropriate acoustic performance in high-rise dwellings is important. An understanding of the requirements and methods of achieving acoustic performance is essential. Remember no two projects are the same. Key points to remember are 1. Thinner, more flexible flooring is more effective as it distributes sound and vibration to the acoustic underlay over a smaller area than thicker, high-density boards. Two. Ensure you are aware of the NCC, strata title, council or star rating requirements. Three, although two underlays may be of the same thickness, 
their sound absorbing properties will almost certainly differ. You cannot substitute one product for another. Four, slab thickness has a significant effect on noise reduction. Sound transmission of a 175 mm bare slab is about 70 dB, whereas a 150 mm slab is about 80 dB. That's twice as loud. And five, timber floor systems with acoustic underlays can often provide 10 to 20 dB reduction in noise.